Um, I'm glad we, uh, thanks for all coming out. That was a little bit bigger group. We thought it was going to be a really small group tonight. Um, and I think we're going to start by just doing introductions and having um, everybody introduce themselves, kind of their um, connection um, to this group. And then Jennifer is going to come up and speak um, um, a little bit about the group and um, the future of the group. And then Priscilla will um, round this out. So why don't we start with introductions and then we'll go from there. Uh, John and Sarah Richards, we've got Ten-year-old boy in Jackson, he's at this, and so far so good. I'm all healthy now. Just so far, just probably in class of what three months ago, something like that. He was kind of annoyed. Annoyed with starting a new medication. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm Jennifer Weber, and I'm husband of 17. I have two daughters with CF, they're almost 21, and then almost 18, I think. And they're both in college. They're doing well, they've been, they started to check out the They weren't annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so they started last month. Um, they both started in November. Actually. Okay. Positive. Yes. Yeah. Went to the and I looked up and I didn't have to section anything out. Everything went to be. She had a lot of. PFTs went up. Yeah, her PFTs went up. She likes them. Yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go with her. She's only 17, but when they've written in, she can go by herself. So, when they bring it, she's in. She's a little strange, I know, I guess. She's not going to get her anymore, I know. She's a freshman at UNC. <laughs> and, uh, quite a mature young woman. It's still hard on the mommy stuff. Yeah, the dad. I know it's exciting. Our last uh, parent ed night, um, we had Dr. Muehlbach talking about uh, trying to uh, our first one. So I'm Dina, my husband, Glenn. Uh, we have uh, two children with CF. Our son is 25, our daughter's 21. They both started Tricasta as well. Have one the day before Thanksgiving and the one on Thanksgiving. So we each remember. Uh, they both are having good results with it. Once PFT was up, Brandon hasn't been back to the doctor yet. Um, and he just, every time he sees us, which he normally doesn't talk about CF, uh, but norm, like now every time he sees us, he's just like, I can't believe how good I feel. Like, and like I was telling him, I'm like, I've never felt joy like that before in my whole life. Like, I don't want to like be over like, oh my God, crazy, because then he'll stop talking about it. So, <laughs> so like inside, I'm like, oh my God. Like, this is like the day we've waited for. So. Other than uh, PFT scores, there's a lot of other changes. With, uh, they're taking less enzymes. They're gaining weight. They're not wore out. Salt Sorry, levels are are uh, not so much. Our salty girl. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, <clears throat> it's almost too good to be true. But it's awesome. It's what we've been. We've been all praying for. Have you done the like where you lift up your lips and kiss them to see if it's salty? Um, not, <laughs> not lately. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me do it. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, keeping us all on our toes, she was moving around, running around, and 
So not only do the stuff go down, there are enzymes that just keep these out. Thank you. I'm sorry that I, I didn't <laughs> do the NARS we get it. Oh, <laughs> but, <laughs> because I know that this is what the time is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jill, and um, I have two daughters. I'm 16 year old Leah, uh, and I also have a seven year old. Anyway, I have to report <laughs> it started after Thanksgiving and early December. We're doing really well. I'm Nicole, and I have um, two boys, a 18-year-old and then a 14-year-old who has the app, and um, he's doing really well. He also started Tricapta. He's the one who started about two weeks ago, and um, he hasn't really noticed too much of a difference. Um, thankfully, he was healthy going into it, so I think that makes a difference. Um, he has noticed some stomach pain, which has been disappointing to him because he wasn't expecting anything. Well, um, I think Jennifer's going to um, share some updates um, about the group. I'm going to also share, I, um, with Heavy Heart, am going to be uh, transitioning into a new program, at a uh, new position at UNC. And um, I'm really going to miss working with um, Jennifer and all of the SIA families. Um, and it's um, going to make me really sad. And it's kind of a, a, a an exciting point to be transitioning when there's some so much going on in the uh, CF world. Um, it's an amazing population to work with, as you guys all know. It's inspiring, and um, it's just amazing to walk in every day to the CF patients and the families and the dedication. So um, I'm still going to be at UNC, so I'll probably maybe be funneling into the clinic. What makes me really happy about transitioning is um, we have a wonderful social worker, Ellen Kenta, who's going really to be um, taking over. She's um, got great experience and um, she's really excited and um, so you'll be seeing a lot of her. Okay. I just have a couple things. But uh, tonight's meal, just for those of you who are new, everything in this space is generally, I mean, generously funded from Impact Pharma. So thank you very much for hosting the meeting. And then we, so Timothy and I wrote a grant three years ago and so started through a grant through a impact, the impact grant, which we was continued to be funded, and then last year we only had funding for two years, and so the foundation said, you know, we have continuing funds, it's not an impact grant, but now it's a continuing program grant. So we wrote for that and received that, so that gives us honoraria to give some a small token to our speakers, and then helps maintain a website, and then we we were able to develop some flyers. And then I was able to go to the conference um, with Lynn in October, the national conference where we had a poster presentation. So I was funded that to try to, because <clears throat> evidently there's a need, or it seems like other CF centers want to start a similar group. So it's sort of in that vein. Anyway, so there's, I did hear that there's continued funding. So grant, this grant ends in March, but there'll be continued funding. But one of the reasons we have the surveys is just is for that grant to show that there's some impact for this group. So that's why there'll be a fee and a post survey going forward at every meeting. I just need people to have something, some data. <laughs> and then let's see. So there's a mom in Charlotte who wants to have a similar group. And so they may be interested in some of the or she may try to somehow stream into our groups. We haven't figured out. Anyway, so we'll see if that's coming in the next day. That was really all I wanted to say. Lynn and I did go to the, we had a poster presentation at the conference. There were 819 poster presentations. Uh, so we had one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, we got some good feedback. Yeah. And a few people have called, like me from Iowa and Texas. And, um, they're interested. So, and then there was a round guy discussion that Lynn spoke at with CS centers, people interested in how the group functions. So, Maybe asking you some questions in the future. They may actually be asking me some questions, but that's all I really wanted to say. There's going to be continued funding. We have to write the grant and it has to be approved, but it seems like they want to. As long as all the financials are good, we should be good. <laughs> okay.
and I know we say it every time as well, but on the surveys, if there's topics or things that you want to talk about, um, I think that's probably the most challenging is trying to find things that people are interested in and, um, right. that, you know, so we can, you know, and I know Ellen's going to take over and, you know, we have lots of resources at the hospital. So anything that you're interested in, want to learn more about, um, a type of speaker, I for anything. Um, and also, I have to say, you've reached out to me too, and they want to be more involved. So that may yeah. be happening too. Um, there's an adult adult coordinator um, contact me last week, I think it was. So we'll see. We'll be maybe. We had to have some collaborative workshops with, between both groups for the uh, nutrition a while back. And yep. we had a physical therapist for the opponent. So we maybe will be doing some of that too. Yeah. We have done some waiting to hear back from them. It's always, you know, but it will work out. And I think all the providers were very interested in doing more collaboration together. I mean, we did the joint family day this year, and um, and Gail Yasher is the social worker, um, is one of the social workers as well, and is very open, and we're, we continually talk. So, um, you know, Gail can get hold of us and get hold of them. And part of the intent of the, the group itself is to develop community amongst ourselves so that we can rely on our, our share our own stories and, and offer help to the younger and older, whatever, you know, things that we've done and that have worked well or not worked well and kind of help one another out. Uh, if there's anything that we could assist with for that, just let us know. We could do better with that. Yeah, it's their topic we want to learn about. Yeah. There's room for that on the second. There we Do you want to introduce? So, some of you may know Priscilla, we were just talking other, um, we have a few different respiratory therapists, and maybe um, Priscilla, you could start off by, because it, it's a little confusing, so we have respiratory therapists that solely do the pulmonary function tests, and then we have respiratory therapists, Raj and Deli, who come in and do kind of more teaching around nebulizers and um, with the vest, and kind of you know, it seems like you guys are pretty, um, we, we, we are, are and, and what is the difference if there is or if there's training? <laughs> but this is Priscilla, and she's in the pediatric clinic at UNC. One of our other respiratory therapists who's in the PFTs, Lynn, you may have met, um, had just retired. Um, so if you're used to Lynn, you might be now working more with Priscilla. And, um, so, how many of you guys are at UNC, and how many are UNC? UNC, UNC, UNC and then, yeah, okay. Just because I was like, I don't like know them, and I'm like, how do I not recognize everybody in here? We get to see everybody in the clinic for years. Um, so, um, in the clinic, we have like a Ronnie, that you guys know, who is a CF specialist, and his job is to help with getting equipment for home and um, kind of coordinating care with different kinds of things. The pulmonary function lab just does pulmonary function testing. Um, and sometimes we'll do a little like asthma teaching and stuff, but we don't do a whole lot of the other stuff that, that Ronnie does. He's there specifically for that. Um, <clears throat> And I don't know, you know, there's probably varying levels of what you guys know about pulmonary function testing, depending on how old your children are and how long you've been around. Um, and, you know, when we talk about lung function tests and PFTs with CF, it generally means spirometry. Um, pulmonary function testing encompasses a whole lot of different kinds of tests, but with CF patients, 99% of it is just spirometry. So that's, and um, has everybody seen somebody do spirometry before? Yeah? No, no. Or you just have a baby, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it will be many years before you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does look better. Um, and uh, every kid is different, and every kid. <laughs> is a different age when they do it. So generally they start them at four or five, depending on their maturity. And some kids are eight before they can do it well. So 
Um, that is a very different so so I um let's see how do I change the slide? Zero down. Yeah. It's not working. I'm like, why is it not working? Yeah. Do you have anybody online? Is Tatiana online? Is there someone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. One. Just one person. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we should have had her. We should have had her. Does she want to in there? No. There we go. All right. So um, I just thought I would talk about what the numbers mean, what all the abbreviations stand for, um, and how that all works. Um, so when we do pulmonary function testing, um, they do a whole bunch of maneuvers. And then what gets, they have to be within a certain range of each other to be good tests. And um, what gets reported is the very best maneuver. So that's what always comes up. And usually, and it has to be within a range to be able to report that. And then they're compared to a reference value. And the reference values come, um, they're based on people's um, age, height, sex, and race. Um, men have bigger lungs, um, different races have different body shapes. And, you know, when you see African people, they have a shorter torso, and um, Hispanic people have longer torsos. So, um, those reference values are based on somebody who has no lung disease and um, that's appropriate for somebody who meets all those other criteria. And then after you perform the test, your numbers are compared to those and that's where all those percentages come from. And these numbers were for me. So I just did a pulmonary function test on myself so I could have some numbers to put up. So. Um, this doesn't relate to any other people. So that very first, um, the FBC is for spider capacity. So that's the total amount of air that you got out with a forced maneuver. So um, when they're blowing super hard, um, it's harder to get your air out. So um, that forced vital capacity might be different than what their lung capacity is in total if they did it, if they did something different. But um, that is from a forced maneuver. Um, and then the second one, the FEV1, is forced expiratory volume in that first second. And that is the biggest number that they look at when they're looking at, are they getting sick? Um, that is the amount of air that came out in that first second. And um, most of the air should come out in one second. Um, cystic fibrosis is considered an obstructive disease, obstructive lung disease, because of all the gunk in their lungs. So when they try to blow the air out hard, all that gunk kind of sticks stuff together and it's harder to get it out. So when there's more stuff in there and they're getting sick, often those numbers start, that's what makes them go down. Um, the, um, the ratio here um, is just a, those numbers divided. Um, and so anybody who has a, any kind of an obstructive, that number is going to be lower than what is considered normal. Um, I have asthma. Um, <laughs> so, the 2575 right there, that number, that is considered your lower airways. And sometimes that goes down a little bit before, you know, like they're starting to be sick and they see that number kind of going down. Sometimes they'll have them come back in in a few weeks to see if something is wrong. Um, but that is the amount of air that comes out within 25 to 75% of the, the time. And I actually I have a spirogram on here so you can see where all these numbers come from. And the last number is um, an effort-based number. How hard did they blow? 
Um, so for all of these um, values, any number that is 80% to 100% is considered normal lung function because everybody is different. Um, some people have 100, some people never have better than 95 on anything. Even people with no lung disease, that's just <clears throat> how their lungs are. So they have to come up with a range. Um, so anything that's 80 and above is considered normal. Um, and then it goes down from there, except for this number right here. This number right here is just the ratio, and I don't know how they come up with it. <laughs> it's lower for older people and higher for younger people. And, um, but the, the reference numbers, you know, as you age and stuff, go down, so. <clears throat> and so then I had this, um, so in our clinic, um, we only do a spirometry. We don't do the inspiratory loop. And the kids go to the adult clinic, they, they do that inspiratory loop. We don't ever have them do that. Um, so on there, you can see where the different you know, it's broken down so you can see where the different numbers come from. So when they blow out super hard and it gets up to that top, when the, when the airflow starts going down, it starts going down. So that peak is how they find the flow. And then you can see the 25 and then down to the 75. And you can see um, where um, they get that number. And they don't have... The FEV1 generally is around here somewhere for most people, right? Almost at the end. So that the, the rest of the air that's in there, which is why they always want to stop immediately, is because they feel like there's not any air left in there. But there's a little bit left. Um, and as they, as if anybody has a lot of obstruction, like, um, I can blow out for like 15 seconds, it's a really long time. Um, so when you have obstruction, you have a lot of air stuck down in your lungs. So then that, instead of looking like that, it'll come like way out. Um, but generally, and the bottom of that is the inspiratory part. So I don't know what else you guys would like to know about testing or was that like overwhelming or do you guys have questions? Do you I don't know, know why they don't do down the peas? So because it's really hard to first to just get them to blow out um, and um, just getting someone especially getting somebody to blow for six seconds is really hard and so um, then asking them to do another forceful inhalation is, and all of the, the information they get from the expiratory part. So um, I never understood, unless the only people we have doing inspiratory loop um, as a pediatric patient, um, generally not a CF patient, somebody who may have an upper airway obstruction. So that's what you can see in an inspiratory loop. So we're not usually looking for like a vocal cord issue or something like that with a CF patient. So that's the reason for the inspiratory. And so I know with PFTs, like, you know, the effort makes the difference and that can change the numbers. And how can, you know, and I've heard the doctors talk about the way that it's shaped and it's like, this isn't a good reading. You know, can you, like, how can they determine if, you know, it was so a good for, you know, effort to make most rate. patients. Um, so, so, so here, remember I said it was um, 80 and above, and this is an effort based number. So, sometimes you'll see like 103 on there. That means they blew really, really, really hard. Um, so, sometimes you can tell because this number is super low. So you can see that and you're like, but from the shape of the um, of the loop, 
and it's not always 100 percent but um, you see that um, that loop has a point at the top so for most people and I'm going to say 85 percent because not everybody will have a point at the top if they have blown as hard as they can blow when they don't it's often rounded at the top instead of being that way um, and when they don't blow really hard it's easier for the air to come out so it's harder to get a good accurate assessment of what the lungs are like when they're not putting forth the effort which is why when somebody is grumpy they're like fine and like not getting anything because they won't do hard <laughs> they won't blow hard so um so that's really how you can tell is that point at the top and sometimes that number um that peak flow is 50 percent if you have really you know bad lung function that might be as hard as you can blow and you'll still see a nice pointy top on it And when when kids are, I know when they're first learning how to do it, and do they always look for reproducible results, or how many times do they? They have there's so the standard is um, two FBCs um, and two um, FEV ones within a certain percentage depending on their age and a certain thing um, and then one other acceptable maneuver it does not have to be exactly the same a lot of the kids are excellent at it and every loop looks exactly the same all the time <laughs> right so how many do they do like there are a couple people that come in on the phone too who have whose children haven't done it so yeah. like how many times would they be asked to perform spirometry for example and then the answer is the first time to do it right like, so it depends on the on the kid you know sometimes there's like a super precocious four-year-old and they come hopping back and they're super excited and they want to do it and they do a great job and sometimes you get pretty good redu reducible things and it's great um sometimes they come back and they start crying the minute they come back there <laughs> And so for those children, because they're shy and everything is scary and it's the hospital, and for those kids, they get a sticker and they go back to their room and thanks for coming to see me because it's more important that they're not upset than because you don't get a whole lot of information generally from four and five year olds anyways. And so for them to think everything is scary and hard all the time, I think is bad because a lot of kids when they're little, like the PFTs, that's the one thing, there's some like seven and eight year olds are like, oh yeah, I get to go do this. That's the exciting thing about coming to the doctor. So that's better than mm -hmm. them being anxious about it when they come. So. You explain what they do when they come and what are they blowing into and how that works. What they get to pick to put on their nose. And oh, okay. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when they come back to the room, um, we um, we have they put nose clips on. Um, and some kids, that's the only thing they do when they come back. They get to pick nose clip color and that's it. But we have different colors. They can pick what color they want um they um we have at unc it's it's a round it's a little round machine um with a tube coming out of it and then we put a mouthpiece on it it's pretty big around so for little kids it's a it's a little challenging for them to put it in their mouth but um some of them do it better than some of the older people like that's too big no it's not <laughs> So they put it in their mouth, you know, they got to put it all the way in their mouth, um, pass for their teeth are. And then they just breathe normal and then we have them take the biggest breath they can and blow as hard as they can. 
Um, oftentimes, we also have games they can play to kind of help inspire them. Uh, we generally like them to try to do it without playing the games first, simply because a lot of the kids will have that come up and then they're like, oh, oh, shoot. <laughs> so if we try to get them to do it sometimes, and, and they can do an almost something, that's a great way to get them to maybe finish it and do a good job. But when we start them doing it that way, oftentimes it's not as good because they just fall apart, <laughs> I guess. Um, what other stuff do you see? Well, the tubing is new and the mouthpieces are sterile. Yes. Well, the, the tubing is sterile, the mouthpieces right. are new. Yeah, the mouthpieces mm -hmm. are new, the nose clips are all <laughs> new. Yeah. And the kids yeah. like the nose clips. They think, mm -hmm. so the, um, the mouthpieces are like these little round things and there's like a, a, a filter in them that keeps any bacteria from the machine, so. Mm -hmm. And they all, they all get to pick their nose clip color, but they're not allowed to touch anything. <laughs> so they have to stay in, because otherwise they're like digging through the, you know, so. Um, and, uh, I guess the in panel and exhale, you, you can see the lines go up and down. Yeah, so you I can always find it kind of soothing. Like sitting in the background, I'd be like, this is kind of bad surprising. I'm going to put this off. That's how the machines are wearing him. Yeah. Because <laughs> <There's, laughs> well, well, I know it's my turn too. It's more of a game for him now. Yeah. It's like a competition. Yeah, how he's <laughs> working. But it's been for a while. Because yeah. he, he tries to look at his numbers and and know, so he's always trying to do better. So um, it's more of a more of a game for them now. So well, that's good. I, to me, I think it's giving them understanding of what they're doing. Yeah. Helps them because I think it gets them more involved. I was going to ask you to take a peek at the last numbers to know what they're shooting for. Yes. Um, yeah. And a lot of the, like, I know both of our girls really well. So um, I don't know why, you know, there are other people I'm like, oh, that you don't see them. And I don't know why that just, I guess luck of when you come to the clinic and when someone's on vacation or whatever, because you only come every several months. Um, so a lot of the kids you kind of know and you know what to get, but the ones that you don't, yes, generally we kind of look to see, not always, not even always just last time, last a couple of times, because sometimes they were either sick or super high or something for them. Yeah. So you can see, you know, kind of where they are to try to get them to hit that number if yeah. they can. I guess my other remark at our old clinic, I would be able to sit in a distance and watch. My daughter growing up liked the games. <laughs> she was motivated by trying to blow out the candles or have the rooster catch the flag or I don't Whatever. know. Yeah, there's all different kinds all of, kinds of and she yeah. actually, I think she had the choice of which one mm -hmm. when she got to know them. I feel like that motivated her. Yeah, and, they, and some of the kids do that. Yeah, even some, as a teenager, she's still like, oh, yeah. <laughs> rainbow. Hi, a 17 year old unicorn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do get very excited. Yeah. Never do old children. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, some of the kids like the games, and some of them, even when they're super young, like, what oh, do you want to, you know, we'll do a couple minutes. Do you want to play a game? No, I just want to be done. Okay. <laughs> Do your best. Yeah. And you, I, I know what they got to hit for me to feel like they don't have to do a whole bunch of maneuvers. So, um, when did they do the box that they sit in? So I know when they, when we they... don't. Um, so that is something that's different. Mm -hmm. um, so when they go to adults, they only have box. They don't have the directions. Um, it's the same thing. Um, the difference is our the dry rolling seal. There's a there's a plate in there that moves back and forth. It measures actual volume. Um, in the box, it's a flow sensor, and it 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 um, calculates the volume based on the flow of what goes in there. So um, they don't make those dry rolling seals anymore. Um, 
So if they ever go, we have actually have an extra one sitting in the other room. The doctors really like the dry rolling seals. They like how they work. Um, and so we've always just kept those. We would never put them in the box because the, bo the box does a lot of things. I, I don't know if that's the right word. Oh, no, I know what you mean. It, it is a box. It's a layer thing. It's, it's actually it's called a box. I think we've yeah. done that before. That's not, not there. That's right. That's right. Just like a boot. That's right. Totally. It's like a boot. It's a boot. It looks like a phone boot. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a boot. That's what you're trying to do. Um, so we, we only use that for, so the only thing that they, like I, they all just do spirometry. So we don't need to use that for spirometry. Um, and also partially because of infection control stuff, we don't want to put them in the box because you got to clean the whole entire box if they go in there. Um, so even when they go to the adult lab, they actually take the sensor out of the box and use the sensor out of the box. They don't have them sit in the box. Um, but, um, so we use the box for people who have other lung issues that need to do different testing than spirometry. So that's what we use the box for. We don't use the box for spirometry. Ever. So. And we have gotten a lot of feedback from <clears throat> transitioning patients when they transition to the adult. And like, I think the number one thing they say is how they do the PFTs is kind of, that it's, that, I don't know if they're just not used to it, but how, like, how is it? Like, I know so you're saying I have gone over different, to Meadowmont, floated over there a few times, yeah. which may also be why some people do. <laughs> so they, so I don't know if you knew that, but they were like pulling me to float over there some. And a couple of times I saw a couple of our patients, I was like the first person they saw when they went in there, like, oh, yay. And, um, but a few of them that have been there a little while, they just said it's different. Um, they, and I think the only thing they felt was different is we are, we take a lot of time and we talk to them and we know stuff about them and we spend a lot they don't do that as much, I don't think, because they don't have time to do that as much. So um, they don't um, remember you asked if they if I look back to see what they had. I the adults don't do that. They come in, they do their stuff. You should know what your stuff is. Um, they come in, they sit down, they blow three times, and they move them out. Now, sometimes it, they flow more often than that, but I think as a general rule, that's how it is when they're opening. So it is a, it's, and it's a very different environment. Um, and that's tough given there's such an emotional, you know, like what your result, and if you feel like it's not a good one, you know, and yes, but it, it, so it is. we are working on, because we are getting some feedback about how, it, it feels really different. And is it just a, is it just a change or is there something we can improve or how we can work on that? So, you had one that just moved over there recently and she probably, well, she's done PFTs twice. Yeah. I didn't know that they did them differently. She didn't tell me. So, <laughs> so yep, yeah, she's super healthy. She's yeah. Super, you know, so, um, and it might, it, it, I know it's more difficult for, some of the ones that have transi transitioned and had more issues. coaching and maybe encouragement or something. Yes, or that. have been yeah. sicker and needed more time. Because you know, some of the sometimes it's a lot of coughing and waiting in between and yeah. So um so yeah, that I mean it, it really it doesn't do anything different, it just looks different. Um I think too when they get to the adult clinic. Instead of talking percentages, they talk about the leaders more. So that I know that was a big change for us when we were in Ohio and then down here at Duke. That all of you're so used to like your 84, 85, 86 percent, 90 percent, like you're talking percentages, and all of a sudden they're like, you know, 2.84 leaders. I'm like, yeah, like what? <laughs> um, so I think some of the reason too. they do that as they get closer to being adults. So every time somebody comes in, they measure them. 
So those percentages are based on their height. So if somebody is measuring them with shoes on like they're not supposed to, or, you know, there are a lot of fluctuations. Adults aren't growing. You know, 20 year olds aren't shrinking. So um, when the height is going like this, those percentages are going like this. So if they just look at the wrong numbers and compare them what the wrong numbers were before, um, they can see what that change, you know, if there's actually a change or if it was just a difference in who measured them. In the pediatric clinic, it's very, they're very, make sure your feet are together, make sure you're touching the wall, make sure you're standing up straight. And now they check and check and check to make sure they're, I don't know that it's as much like that in there. They get older because we want them to grow and mature. So that might be some of the reason why they do it that way. Whenever I work over there, I look with their height was last time and use the same one because I know they didn't grow. <laughs> The FBV1 is, seems to be the key number. Yeah. Yeah. And how much weight is given to the result? It seems, is it just one factor in the overall spectrum, or is it just more of a, or does it depend on the doctor blood that go you? Oh, if that number goes down a significant amount, like 10% is considered significant, or that doesn't matter who your doctor is, they're going to pay attention to it. Yeah. So. And is it just confirm what is already known by the patient or the parents or the? Generally, or when somebody like comes down and their lung function is significantly lower, like they'll come in and, you know, because a lot of the, I mean, we see a lot of the same patients over and over again, and we know a lot of stuff about them. and. So if their lung function is super low, like they do a couple of maneuvers, it's like, have you been coughing a lot? Because you, you, and they're like, yeah. So generally when a patient comes in, they will know. And every once in a while, somebody will come in and say, and I'm like, oh, it's a little bit, but not really. And they're like, oh, I'm surprised. I thought I was going to be sick. So. Most people know their body. <laughs> I have a question about, um, we heard before, we hear about um, patients um, who are below, well over 100 at one Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> it means they have good lung function. So that's why it's a reference. So some people blow over that. And and there and we do have CF patients who, who have that kind of lung function, um, and that is where they want you to stay. That is your baseline. That is where they want you to stay. So um, even though it's like super normal, that's you know, and we have patients like that who have great lung function like that. Um, we um, it doesn't mean there's because it's everybody's body is different. So, so even uh, if 80 is normal level, 120 is still normal level. I don't know that we have any 120s. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have any 120s. And I can also say, you know, a lot of people are talking about trichapta. And we've had a few patients who have really good lung function start trichapta. Um, and they talked about these huge differences that people get. Well, when your lung function is already really good, you can only get a little tiny bit of improvement because it's already great. But, you know, so I think a few people were like, oh. and I'm like, well, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, some people do have lung function like that. Brandon, yeah, 100 and like between 105 and 110. Till he was probably about 15, but that whole entire time, like we just said, you're cheating. Like, what are you doing? Because like, he, like, he cheats at board games and stuff. So like, <laughs> <laughs> you can't cheat. 
If there was a poster kid for doing the PSP, that would have been great. Because he just had the whole thing set. As soon as he got in, he was like in the zone. And he would do, yeah, his numbers were just like ding, ding, ding. And there are some kids like that. Some kids are 12 years old, still struggling, struggling to try to figure it out. And I'm thinking, I wish you guys could be in the room with each other and you could just watch this guy do it. Maybe you'd get it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, some kids are great at it. So, yeah, some people do have one function like that. But because it's a range, like if your baseline is 90 and your baseline is 110, that might be equal, you know, or is that not? Or yeah, that yeah. is right. So, if you're, you've always been 90, always, always, always been 90, then that's what you are. Yeah. Um, and that's what they're looking for. When you drop the 80, they're like, all right, you're super sick. Somebody else is normal as 80, and they're, that's how they are always. And they would be like, well, 80's really good. Why is 80 bad? Well, because it's their lung function. Because for some people, 95 is like super sick. So the equipment fairly well evenly calibrated. Because I always Every thought, day. oh, it's those people who went down in that city who are always <laughs> so I'm like, is it at their clinic? Every day, every morning, that's yeah. the first thing we do. Yeah, but like even compared to other centers, it's very standard. Um, I can tell you that some people find, so yeah. there's the dry rolling seal that we use, um, which has that thing that slides back and forth on it. Um, and then there's the flow sensor. So the flow sensor is just blowing into nothing. And then the dry rolling seal, you're like actually pushing something. So some people find one or the other easier to do. I don't know why, um, but they're always using the same equipment when they're, yeah, in our you know, your own. So it's always going to be the same because we always use the same thing. You will get different results though, because like when you're in a study, sometimes they do it like on a laptop part of the study, and then your regular clinic, like we were always in class. Um, and you get different results. We're like, why is this five percent less? And we know we just did it a clinic two weeks ago, you know. So I think to your point, it's the uh, it's more about what you're used to than the actual yeah function. And I don't really trust them. <laughs> but they use them for all the time. Yeah. Anything else? Back to your point too about moving from like the peas to adults. The one thing, even like in the peas when the kids were younger, it does have an impact on them who the respiratory therapist mm -hmm. is because there's some that are really like, oh, 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 you know, and others like, okay, go ahead, blow. you know. So yeah. I think that does play into it. And I don't know if that affects the adults at all too. Like, you know, an adult respiratory therapist may not want to be like, wow, wow. <laughs> But they still meet, you know, the adults still may eat that. Yeah, I do think that was that is a little bit of the difference. And it's yeah, like they're liking mean, that they're, encouragement and that coaching yeah. where if you're just like going to do it and you're like, wait. And then they feel like you feel like it's kind of rushed maybe on top of that. You're yeah. like, yeah. And I don't know, some I think a few of them I felt like they didn't get any coaching sometimes. They're just like, okay, go ahead, I'm here. So. so they're doing it about three times, you said, over there, probably. And how many times do they do it in the peak after that? Well, so um, it depends on the child. Right. Um, so some children sometimes, I mean, so technically we have eight maneuvers that we're allowed to do. Um, but... Um, we can overwrite ones that we gray out. And so sometimes when some of the kids are not feeling as well, it takes them longer to do a good job. So we let them do however many they will do until they get to where they feel like. And sometimes some of the kids go up with each maneuver. So we try to let them keep going until they quit going up. So, and some kids have really... Some people have very interesting rituals. There's one kid that likes to stand up and then sit down, stand up and then sit down, stand up and then sit 
interesting. That's <laughs> And there are some people who only do three because they don't like to do it. And so I have made a bargain. If you come and do your best and you get three really good maneuvers, you only have to do three. And that gets them to come and work hard and do their three maneuvers. So I don't, and I don't know why some kids love it, some kids hate it. Well, I know why a few of them hate it. For other ones, I'm not quite sure. Are there different things that parents can do with their children when they're younger to kind of prepare them for how to learn to blow out hard or anything like that? Not really. There's not a whole lot you can do. Um, when they get older and some of the kids have been a few times um, and they're just not really like because it's that really super blast of air. Sometimes I tell them to have family spitball competitions because that helps a little bit. And so they, everybody gets a straw and puts a little thing in there and they sit and see who can go the farthest because that's a really forced you, like a hard. So that kind of gets them to do the hard blow sometimes. But that's really, you know, because it's such a unique, you know, put the big thing in your mouth thing that it's hard to get. It's hard to know how to do it before you have to do it. And even sometimes parents are like, oh, well, they can, no, they're trying really hard. You can tell them they're trying hard. That's all they can do. <laughs> what is the difference? It's different for everybody. Um, generally, four or five. Some kids love doing it at four. Some kids don't. <laughs> so it just depends on how shy or how outgoing they are. You know, everybody is different. So. Yes. Jim. Jim. Yeah, yeah. He was a cheerleader. Yes, yeah. He was, a cheerleader. <laughs> was it Lynn or who's the other guy? Some guy was just totally chill. Like would just sit there and breathe in. Breathe that's out. that's Lynn. He's very he's very calm. Like, he's very oh, 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 oh. Everybody has their own little thing, and yeah. honestly, some kids do better with some people, and some kids do better with other people. Right. But yeah, yeah. Um, some kids just do great with everybody. And sometimes, some kids will come in and be like, "I only want to see Lynn. I only want to see myself. <laughs> All right, go. All right." And now that you know, Lynn has retired. He has been there sporadically, and it. Apparently, he's been here every time I've been on vacation is when they have come. <laughs> so, um, so then they only recognize me, and I have somebody who's just been floating to help on some days. And some of the kids are like, well, can I just wait? Because they don't like somebody they don't know, even though it's probably just fine. I guess you get to be a creature of habit. Oh, yeah. And other kids are like, whatever. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I have a post survey to give out. Uh, if anyone has any ideas or things that you'd like to you know, hear presented on, please write it down. Sure, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, and he did put some, I guess, the ankle or something, but I know the ankle is a bit of a person, like any star or something. Okay. <laughs> 